Welcome back to this final part of the GNN series. So in the following we will use PyTorch Geometric and the library called RDKit to build a simple GNN that can handle molecule data and I will use a Google Colab notebook for this. So let's switch to the notebook. So this is the overview on what we will do in the following. So first we talk about the installation of PyTorch Geometric and RDKit and then some background information about the data set and then we will finally implement the GNN and train it. So let's get started. So the installation is pretty simple. You have to run these three commands here, uh, which will install PyTorch Geometric for you. These will only work for CUDA version 10.1. So I assume you're training on a GPU. Also make sure under runtime, uh, change runtime type, that you select the GPU session. And yeah, so this installation only works for CUDA 10.1 and on Google Colab you can check this version like this. And these first two blocks will install PyTorch Geometric for you. And then there's a larger block for RDKit. So first of all, RDKit is a Camo Informatics library from Python, which can be used to handle molecule data. I will show you in a second how exactly this works. And the thing is, RDKit needs to be compiled and can only be installed using Anaconda currently. So there's no pip installation available. And therefore, on Google Colab, you first have to install Miniconda and so on. So simply run this cell and you will get RDKit installed. Uh, if you do it locally, you can of course simply conda install RDKit. But here it's a little bit more complex, but don't worry, just run the cell and you will be good to go. So this is the installation, pretty simple. And now let's have a look at the data set we will use in the following. So the data set we will use comes from PyTorch Geometric. So there's already a set of data sets you can use, which come shipped with PyTorch Geometric, uh, like Amazon, Knowledge Graph, data sets and whatsoever. So a large variety, as you can see, a lot of data sets. The one we will use are, of course, molecule data sets and ours come within PyTorch Geometric from a large collection of molecule data, which is called MoleculeNet. So they also have a website where you can find some of the data sets and you find the representation of the data and the task, for example, regression problems and so on. I just left a link here and we will use one specific data set, which is called ESOL. And I just quickly read this quote. ESOL is a small data set consisting of water solubility data for 1,128 compounds. The data set has been used to train models that estimate solubility directly from chemical structures as encoded in smart strings. So what this means is basically we have a solute, which is a molecule in our case, and then we have a solvent, which is water in our case, and then we have the solution which we want to predict. And this will be a regression value that tells us how different molecules are dissolving in water. So it's a pretty simple problem. And yeah, so we have the data provided in a small string. And what this exactly means is if you have a molecule like this one, it's ibuprofen, you can represent the graph structure of this molecule also as a string. And this string is called small string. And this includes all the atoms, like here we have some carbon atoms, um, some oxygen and whatsoever. And then this representation basically tells you how the molecule looks like. But you shouldn't directly use this representation because it's not unique and there exist also different grammars on the small string. And a better way is to use the graph representation and that's why we will use our dkit. Meanwhile, there exist also approaches to uniquely use the smile string, canonical smiles, but that's not important for now. So we will use graphs as we want to use graph neural networks. So that's why we use RDKit for the smiles representation. Okay, so now let's have a look at the data set. We can simply load it using torchgeometric.datasets and then import molecule net. And then we specify the name of our data set. We want ESOL and then it's downloading it and there we have it. So it's performing some pre-processing uh, in between and then we have 1,128 molecules. And next we can have a look at some basic properties. So these four lines tell us it's a molecule net object. It contains nine features on the node level. 
there's one target value which means we have a regression problem and finally we have 1128 molecules so next we can have a look at one specific molecule in this data set if we print it we get something like this so we see we have a smiles representation like the one we've seen above and we have an x vector which are our node features we have a y vector which is our target value so our regression value for this molecule our label and we have information about the edges more specifically we see we have 32 nodes for this molecule at position 0 and 68 edges if we print these nodes or the node features we get something like this so these are 32 instances and each of them has nine individual features and if you remember the graph we used previously this basically means each of these lines represents one node feature vector next to a node and here we have 32 of them as we have 32 nodes so that's pretty simple next we have the edge information in this case we have a format called COO which basically tells us node 0 is connected to node 1 node 1 is connected to node 0 and so on so it's a set of tuples of connections and this um, representation is more efficient than an adjacency matrix as you have way less entries because for an adjacency matrix you would have 32 by 32 because we here we had 32 nodes and here you have a smaller representation and finally we can have a look at the target value at the label for example here minus 0.77 which expresses the water solubility if we quickly recall node level, edge level and graph level prediction problems, here in our case we only have one output value as we have a graph level prediction problem. There exist also node level prediction problems like these uh, where you have one prediction for each node like this, but here we will have the situation on the left. Okay, now let's talk a bit more about the smiles representation and how to get the features as you remember the smile string looks something like this and now we can use our dkit which can produce objects molecule objects that allow a variety of functions for example you can iterate over the atoms over the bonds get certain properties for example check if some parts of the molecule are rings things like these so our dkit is great to generate features in our case however we already have this information as we already have these uh, node features and they were pre-processed by PyTorch Geometric in this step and that's why we imported our dkit here when we load this data set it's basically already pre-processed by our dkit so we don't have to manually generate the features anymore this was already done but this is just a side note if you have your own personal data set you can use our dkit to simply generate features like for example, you can get the atom types, the number of protons, the bond types, and so on. So now let's talk about the more interesting part, how we implement the GNN in PyTorch Geometric. And implementing a GNN works the same way as implementing every other uh, PyTorch model. The only difference is that we use different layers. And these layers now come from torchgeometric.nn. So one of these layers is the GNN conf layer. This is a simple graph convolutional layer, so a simple message passing layer. And we will use this for our model. Just a remark, there exist a variety of other layers like the graph attention layer and so on. And the way it works is we define the two functions which is standard in PyTorch, so the init function and the forward function. In the init function we define our layers, so we have four message passing layers. The first of them is a transformation layer which transforms our nine node features to an embedding vector of size 64. And then we have a couple of more message passing steps. And then we have a linear output layer, which has an output shape of one, which means we want to perform a regression. So then in our forward function, we simply pass our node features and the edge information. And this can then be used by the layers we just initialized here. And for example, we can perform the first message passing step by simply passing this information to this layer. And then we also apply an activation function 
and we perform the next steps and so on. So this is a general architecture of our GNN. You might have seen that we have some global pooling here. We will first go into detail why we exactly do it like this. As you know, we want to perform graph level predictions and therefore we need to combine the node states of our graph into one representation. One first idea could be simply to append them. So basically would have the first node, then the second one and so on. But the problem is that for one graph, we might have 20 nodes and for another one, we might have 50 nodes. So the size of this representation would be dynamic and would change from graph to graph. And therefore we need a global pooling mechanism that can squeeze any number of nodes into one fixed representation. And here we use a combination of mean and max pooling. This means we take the mean of all of these nodes and we take the max of all of these nodes or of their node features. And then we can eventually concatenate the information of the mean pooling and the max pooling. All of our graph information is then embedded in this final representation. Meanwhile, there exist more intelligence ways instead of mean and max, but for now the simple approach will be sufficient. Another alternative is to perform graph pooling, which means the input graph is reduced over time. First you start with five nodes, then four nodes and so on, until you end up with a representation that contains all the information about the graph. But for now, we will simply pass this graph over the layers, perform the message passing, and in the final layers, we summarize all the information of the node features from the individual nodes. So back in our Google Colab notebook, we see that we have this linear output of the embedding size times two. And the reason for this is in the global pooling step, we perform on one hand GMP, which is the global max pooling, and GAP, which is the global mean or average pooling, and then we concatenate them. That means we have two vectors appended, and therefore we need twice the size here. And so this is our um, summarizing step, which uh, compresses all information into one vector, and this will be passed to our final output layer. So if we summarize the architecture of our GNN now, we can see we start with nine node features, project them to embedding size of 64, then perform some more message passing layers, and then we have the stacked compressed representation, which is twice the embedding size, so 128, and then one regression value output. And the number of parameters is also not too high, which is good because we only have 1000 data points, I quickly want to give some remarks on node level prediction problems. So in our case, we have a graph level prediction problem and don't have to worry about this. But in case you are working with node level predictions or edge level predictions, you might have encountered binary masks. What this means is that for the training and for the prediction, you don't have all of the nodes available. So for example, for the training, you would only have node one, two and four available. And for the prediction, you only want to perform it on node three and five. And that's why you often encounter binary masks in these node level prediction problems. And these masks basically tell you which nodes to use for each of the tasks. For example, if you want to perform predictions, you would use the mask to only get predictions for these two nodes. This is just a side note. So basically just use them to mask out the nodes you're not interested in. So next let's talk about how we can train the GNN. So first we define a loss function and an optimizer, which is Adam in our case. And we also specify the learning rate for our training. Then we will also use the GPU if it's available. So we will put our model to the GPU. And finally, we will use data loaders from Torch Geometric to use batching, so a batch training. And therefore we pass 80% of our data to the train loader and the rest, so 20% to the test loader. And the batch size of each batch is 64. This means we have 64 molecules in each of these batches. So the data loader in PyTorch Geometric works a little bit different and I will give some remarks on how exactly it works. It's not too important when using it, but I think it's nice to know. So let's have a look. 
So batching is commonly used in deep learning for reasons such as training speed up or also more stable convergence. Using graph data, the batching appears to be a bit more complex as we have graphs of different shapes. So for example, one of them has five nodes, the other one has six nodes and so on. The way how this is handled is simply by concatenating all node features in a larger matrix and additionally combining the individual adjacency information into a huge adjacency matrix or list. And now the whole batch, so basically 64 molecules, appear to be one large graph with a giant adjacency matrix. The trick here is that the individual graphs are disconnected in this adjacency matrix and therefore no information will be passed between the graphs but only within the graphs. So the message passing for example for graph 1 only happens among these node feature vectors. The advantage of this approach is that we can simply input a large graph and get the updated node embeddings for all of these individual graphs. You can read more about this on the PyTorch geometric documentation, but for now just keep in mind this data loader does some heavy work for us in the background. So next we define a train function where we iterate over the individual batches of our loader and we will put the batches to the GPU, call the optimizer to reset the gradients and then we pass the X vector, which is the node embeddings or node features, the edge information and a batching index to our model. And then we obtain the predictions and the updated embeddings. And then we can calculate the loss from these predictions and optimize our model. So in this example, I performed 2000 epochs. And as you can see, the loss is decreasing. So we end up with relatively small mean squared error, or actually it's root mean squared error losses. And we can also visualize the training as it's done here. So you see it's decreasing, it's quite noisy still. You might have to tweak the learning rate and other things, but overall it's decreasing and that's what we want. We should also check the test error. So this is only the training loss, but for now, this uh, is sufficient. And if we have a look at the test prediction using our test data loader now, so we analyze uh, one of the batches. And as you can see on the left, we find the real predictions. So basically the real solubility values. And on the right, we have the predictions of our model. And as you can see, sometimes it's pretty close as here, for example, or here it's also pretty close. Sometimes it's off like here. But overall, the prediction works pretty well. And we can also print this. So a perfect line would be a perfect prediction model. But here we have some variance around the predictions. But overall, uh, we have a good model with only a small architecture for this example. And now finally, you can also further improve the model. Uh, you can try out different things like dropouts, global pooling layers, batch normalization, things like these, or more intelligent pooling mechanisms. And you can also perform hyperparameter optimization. These are just some examples you can play around with. But for now, that's it for this GNN series. I hope you liked it and you learned something. And if you have questions, just let me know, leave a comment, and also feel free to subscribe. I will produce more of these videos in the future. So have a good day and see you in a future video.